on experience. Uh, thanks, Jenny, for recording that. Uh, so for those who doesn't know me, I'm Volen Arkumarev from the Bulgarian Society for the Protection of Birds. We've been trapping and tagging Egyptian vouchers on the Balkans, uh, also in Ethiopia, along the flyway, uh, with some unsuccessful attempts, like in, in Niger, for example, and some successful attempts in Ethiopia, in, in Bulgaria. We have uh, quite a number of good researchers in the group already, so I would just like to open the discussion. And let's first try with the trapping methods. If you want, I can share from our experience what trapping methods we, we used, and then everybody, everybody can share uh, his thoughts or our experience. So uh, first of all, we've been trying to trap Egyptian vouchers for quite a long time. Actually, the first efforts in Bulgaria started in 2000 and, uh, 2004, 2005, so a long time ago. And uh, the, first, uh, the first successfully trapped adult individuals in Bulgaria were actually in 2013 or 2014. Jenny, uh, Jenny was here and she was uh, together with uh, Vladi and were able to trap some of the were able to trap two adults actually at that time so they can, they can share how it worked for them uh, then well it's uh, may, maybe i can i can i can uh, give some more information uh yeah the first successful trapping of adults was uh, actually was in 2005 but uh, we were like, uh, let's say these were our first steps uh, in uh, like trapping vouchers at all. Uh, we, we managed back then to, uh, to trap three birds. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, you know, we didn't have tags back then. So we, we ring the birds. Uh, hopefully one of them is still alive. It's a female, still breeding. Uh, but uh, then the, the second attempt like came 10, 10 years after after that in 2015, uh, when with uh, with Jenny and uh, also with Mike, uh, we were trying to like we we're trying for one month to trap to trap adults, uh, testing different methods. Uh, we initially started with uh, uh, with with loops with uh, uh, with nooses, but uh, unfortunately they never uh, you know they never uh, uh, took the the bait. So. Uh, we uh, we tried also with the with the, with the trap, but uh, of course uh, we didn't have much time uh, to uh, to have the trap installed on the trapping area. So uh, birds were uh, actually they didn't want to go into the trap. In the it it was a cage actually, and uh, what worked finally was the was the trap that uh, Jenny and Ewan uh, brought uh, brought to Bulgaria and. Uh, I, I think Jenny can give the best information on this trap now. Yeah, so we ended up being successful in trapping using a whoosh net or clap net, which is an elastic fired net which fires over the top of the birds. It's a trap that Ewan built, Ewan's on the call, um, and is good because you don't need too much specialist equipment, um, but we were able to fire it on a sort of a pre-existing site i think the key for all these trapping methods is having a known food source um that you know that the birds are going to come into um we did try to use the same method in macedonia that in 2015 as well but weren't successful because the setup wasn't the same the birds weren't used to being fed in the same way um but yeah ewan's on the call so he might be able to talk more about using cannon nets or rock nets to trap birds Maybe he doesn't hear us. Yep, probably not. Uh, yeah, so I guess there's probably not much for me for me to add to that. So I think, um, yeah, the, the the net, the wish net that we ended up using, I think, was about fifteen meters by five meters, which is sort of um, about as large <laughs> as I could make it without sort of ending up with problems with the 
with the net not firing properly or being being too slow. Um, the good thing about Egyptian vultures were was that they they were really placid. So as soon as the net the net fired, um, you know the birds just just lay down and you could just walk up to them and pick them up. We sort of had visions of them sort of thrashing around and uh, sort of escaping out from under the under the edge, which um, yeah, which, which wasn't an issue. Um, I, I don't have any experience of cannon netting vultures. Mike McGrady does, but uh, I do do a lot of cannon netting of sort of waders, geese, uh, and and ducks, which you know does does have um, sort of the benefits that you can you tend to be able to hide a net much better. Uh, you don't have big poles sticking out of the ground. You don't have the big long bungee elastics, which um, in fact, in the case of Bulgaria, that was one of the issues was um, in the hot sun that caused the elastics to vibrate a lot. So that it was actually create, just the, the heat was creating movement actually in, in, in the trap. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously ca cannon netting is, you know, quite, quite specialist, but, uh you know can can be extremely safe way of uh way of catching yeah catching birds um so if there's sp specific questions i won't be able to answer anything to do with cannon netting vultures but uh, i do have a lot of experience just with cannon netting in general yeah thanks uh, so generally uh, uh generally the main things that sh that uh, should be considered at least from our experience is uh, the timing of trapping especially uh, especially of adults like what we do is we avoid trapping adults immediately after they return from the wintering grounds because the birds are exhausted and uh, they need to uh, be prepared for the for the breeding uh, to gain weight and you know to to be fit for the breeding so uh, that's why for adults, uh, we start the trapping uh, after the chicks uh, hatch and after they're at least uh, 15, 20 uh, days old. So um, big enough that um, the absence of one of the parents from the nest would not uh, affect their survival. That's a very important thing to consider if you are planning to trap uh, Egyptian vultures uh, anywhere. And uh, of course, in the wintering grounds, it, uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, another important, important aspect is the timing of trapping. What we found is that uh, birds are more, uh, you know, easily trapped and during the feeding, and this is usually in the early, early mornings uh, or late in the afternoon during the midday. If you plan a trapping event in the midday, you might end being very unsuccessful unless you're using uh, Ron's uh, cage. So Ron is raising hand, please Ron, uh, join. Yeah, uh, hi, I'll, I'll give some of my experience. I, I tried many different methods uh, in the past few years. Uh, so first, because Warren mentioned it, I'll start with that. Uh, we have a cage that was designed by uh, mainly by other Sofia and others uh, years ago. We use many for griffin vultures. The idea is that the cage uh, has an opening at the top. Uh, it's a big cage, eight by eight <clears> by four, I think, or eight by eight by three. And uh, it has an opening on the top. And when griffin vultures are big and uh, not as smart as Egyptian vultures, they go in, they can't go out. Uh, we put food on the roof and food inside and they just go in, they can't go out. I tried it for Egyptian vultures. What I did is I, I narrowed the entrance uh, in the roof. I made it uh, pretty small, uh, so about uh, one meter over 20 centimeters entrance, uh, or even smaller sometimes. And then most of them can't go out. So they go in and they can't go out. And, and I put inside uh, two Egyptian vultures from our captive breeding uh, program, two birds that can't fly. So they attracted the other birds. And this worked only one year. I tried it for three years. So the first year, two months of trying, I caught uh, one bird. The second year, three months of trying, I caught two birds. And then the third year, suddenly I caught 12 birds um, during three months. So it takes time, but it, it's, um, it, it, I, I don't need to do anything but just to 
um, make sure there's food there and uh, the uh, camera there is five minutes drive from where I live. So uh, just put a camera there and, and whenever there was a vulture, I could see it and, and go and really sit. So that was one thing, but the, you talked about the cannonet. I also use the cannonet, uh, but unfortunately in Israel, we have to use a, a pneumatic cannonet, which means it's very big and uh, the vultures were scared of it. So I had to put it in a safe place, which is a feeding station that's uh, nobody goes there. So I put it there for, uh, I think a couple of weeks, it was there every day with food and it was just there in the field, uh, but inactive. And then I came and I was in a hide for um, three days. I went back home at night, but three days. And then the third day, uh, we had enough vulture close enough. So eventually we caught four, which is not amazing, but I guess if I would stay for a few more days, we could catch more. So it's working. And as, as was said, it's very safe and, and very quick and you can catch a lot of vultures at the same time. It's a cannon with a very big net. It's uh, 20 by 12 meters. Um, so I guess if I had more patience and more time, I could maybe catch, catch somewhere. Uh, but interestingly, it was only um, uh, young birds, so second and third year birds, the adults, uh, didn't, didn't come close enough. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, we also use a cage now in in Bulgaria for trapping, even though it's a it's a different approach. It's a cage that's five by five by two meters uh, big, uh, and it's a it's a walk-in trap. So the vouchers walk inside, and then we pull a rolling door, uh, and we close them inside. And actually, uh, we we built that cage for griffon vouchers, but um, after three years after the cage was installed on the feeding station, the Egyptian vouchers also started getting in. So it took three years to to make them getting into the cage. And now, last season and this season, uh, we sometimes have up to 10, 12 individuals inside the cage which is uh, very promising. And now it makes it much easier. Like this year, we trapped uh, six at a time, which was uh, very good. Uh, two of them were already with transmitters. So we had to, we had to release them and we tagged the other four. But uh, anyway, it seems that if you install such a cage, as in Ron's case, and as in our, our case, if you install uh, such a cage at a feeding station where there is a regular presence of uh, the species, it will take some time, probably a few years, until they get accustomed to it and start using it. But uh, it's a good method to really trap uh, many at a, at a time, probably in, in the long term, if you have a long term uh, program. Um, Vladi wants to interfere, wants to mention something. Yeah, it's about the cage. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it takes time for them to get used to. So the best approach is really to like to install it now and just rely on the you know, on time that eventually they will get used to it. However, uh, one of the I, I think one of the uh, important notes about the cages is uh, except for the proper size, but also the materials and just make sure if you're using a cage that it will stand the weather conditions because we also have cages that that have been destroyed by uh, by uh, either snow or wind. So it's uh, something important that uh, I believe it should be take, taken into consideration when, uh, when constructing a, a cage. Yeah, thanks. That's, uh, you see now, I shared my screen. You see now that's the cage that we use. It's quite simple. Uh, here is the door. I don't, I guess you see my mouse. Uh, here is the, the door. And you see inside there are seven, eight, nine Egyptian vouchers. So it's important that we, we are hiding in a height that's about 20, 30 meters away from the cage. And when we see that there is a clearance, like there are no birds near the door, uh, only then we close because there's always a risk that some birds, some bird is trying to escape. And if you do not close the door so quickly, you might, you might hurt a bird. And, and generally, uh, we are very worried about, you know, the well-being of the, of the endangered species. So, um, it, this should be, uh, considered, um, as for other other methods that we successfully used uh, in Ethiopia, we managed to trap uh, 15 uh, Egyptian vouchers with the leg hold traps, like um, 
those traps that are yeah that they use for foxes, jackals, coyotes, whatever. Uh, we purchased them from the states, and then we we had to hammer the springs of the traps so that they are not not so strong in order not to break the legs of the of the vouchers, and also put some padding to make them softer. So the good point of uh, you know of using uh, leg hold traps is that you can completely cover you can completely cover them with uh, sand or soil, so the vouchers cannot see anything. And usually the Egyptian voucher is very suspicious. So even a small string or a metal part makes it go around. So uh, when you cover when you cover the traps and they don't see it, it's it's much easier. But then the main disadvantage is that you know these traps are like uh, 20, 30 centimeters big, and the chances to have a bird uh, stepping on the right position to get trapped are are really slim. So what we did uh, in Ethiopia uh, to, to improve the trapping effort was that uh, actually we, uh, we were trapping at a rubbish dump where a lot of vouchers were walking around, but also marabous and other, other birds. So what we did is uh, we built uh, some small piles of, um, of um, um, soil and then we put the trap just on the top because the Egyptian vouchers like to perch on some a little bit high, higher locations in the landscape and they were actually using these piles a lot and so we got like in one day once we trapped three individuals just within one hour uh, using these methods so it was a, a good approach but if you use leg hold traps, you should really be careful that you do not harm the bird. So when you when you prepare the traps, first we always try with our fingers, and if it doesn't hurt your finger, uh, it's probably not gonna hurt the bird either. So uh, luckily, all our fingers are on place now, and we got some birds and no no injuries uh, at all, which is uh, positive. Uh, Lale wants to add something or to ask a question. Lale? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, our method that we use in Eastern Turkey is kind of similar to this. We adjusted mammal traps early in the morning, about 1 or 2 a.m. with Evan. And then, yeah, we during the day. Uh, what trap, sorry? Mammal. Ah, okay. Wolf. Like but this, we, we were, like this yeah. on, the back, on the picture. Yeah, looks like, but yeah. um, is this picture just to show or is this the way you use it? Uh, this one. Yeah, it's the way we use, like we, all, we set it and then we cover it with sand. And this is, you see this black part, it's the, it's the padding to make it yeah, soft. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah we, were, yeah, we were using cottons and all similar. Yeah. yeah. And then we were using one big uh, stick, metal stick, which is heavy, placing yeah. it in the middle. And we were having like a circle and a couple of them around the circle. And then, yeah, I mean, they notice any little different on the soil or the grass. We were using the dump site uh, nearby hills where they roost during the day. And yeah. yeah, sometimes you get them immediately. Sometimes it takes longer, like two weeks for one bird. Uh, yeah. But we yeah. were having problems in this method. We were having problems with feral dogs and other species like crows and, you know, like other birds, gulls that we don't want to trap, but we were ringing them anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the same. That's the main disadvantage of the leg hold trap that it's not selective. Yeah. And you catch anything that's that steps there and then you have to run and and then mm -hmm. other birds are just scared yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a nightmare this is what we experienced in niger for example we we yeah. trapped so many ravens and all that at the end all the egyptian vouchers were just uh, yeah. afraid of that place and they didn't want to go there anyway yeah but it's a <laughs> technique with a really high adrenaline for us yeah yes <laughs> yeah it's uh it's it's really good method, but yeah, it has downsides as well, uh, like especially the the the, re, uh, the fact that it's not selective. Uh, so it's 
I mean, that's why one of the, I think, most important uh, uh, things to consider is just the distance to the traps and uh, you're fast in the swift reaction when, when a bird is trapped. And of course, just to be aware of the dogs and, and other animals that, that are around. For example, the rubbish site, uh, the rubbish dump or the site where you're trapping. So it's uh, uh, like in a note from the, about this method, we, we, we have used it also in, in Central Asia and it's uh, very successful there but uh, it tends to be uh, quite unsuccessful around breeding territory. So uh, I think the best uh, place to, to use it is uh, on dump sites or other congregation sites. And uh, maybe it, it will work uh, very close to a, breeding, uh, to a breeding site to a nest, but uh, it will take much more time. And, uh, but I, I believe uh, one of the best positives, like one of the best, uh, biggest pluses of this method is that is, I mean, it's relatively cheap and it, uh, it, it takes no time to install it actually. The same with the snares, just not selective. Uh, Ron is raising here, uh, hand. Yeah, I have uh, three questions if, if that's okay. Uh, first, I want to ask you about the, the walking trap. Uh, is it in a fenced area? I don't remember. Because, yes. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so no, no mammals. Fish. No mammals at all. Okay. Mm. Uh, second, about the, uh, the leg, leg old traps, uh, how many vultures should be in the area for it to be successful? I mean, would you do it if there are only five vultures at the, at the area, or does it have to be a mass of, of vultures for, in order for them to be trapped? It's it's a matter of luck. In Bulgaria, we trapped uh, we trapped one Egyptian uh, while like there were only six seven individuals around, and one of them just stepped on the wrong place. So we named it Lucky <laughs> because it was unlucky. But uh, but if you if if you notice where the birds are standing, usually even if you have a low number of individuals, but you know very well where they like to roost or to, to sit on the ground and you install the traps there, I think you have good chances to trap even in a you know place visited by less birds. Okay, and the third question, did anyone try uh, in breeding areas around the nests to catch Egyptian vultures with a stuffed eagle owl or something in, in a dogaza net or something like that? We tried with an eagle owl in, in Bulgaria some years ago, uh, but it was uh, it was unsuccessful. Like the Egyptians didn't attack it at all, um, even though we placed it very near the nest. And actually we tried it only once, like in two territories in, in just two days, uh, but it was in July. So the chicks were already quite big and maybe that's why the, um, Oh, uh, no, sorry, we didn't use the eagle owl, we used the raven. Um, but, but yeah, I know that uh, Lavrentis managed to trap some eagles, like lesser spotted eagles in, in, in Greece just last year with an eagle owl and with a net. Um, but no, with, with the Egyptian, at least, I don't know if anybody else knows something and, or have tried in the group. Mm -hmm maybe in Egyptian vulture territories where naturally, uh, naturally the eagle owl and the, and the ravens occur and they are very close, they, they might not be really affected by their presence. Uh, and I'm not sure about the, how like, uh, let's say, good for the birds is this method because it's like you create a, a huge stress to the birds uh, bringing uh, like a, another raptor. But any trapping is stressful, so. Yeah but it's double stress then. I, th I think there is a paper from Spain about the effectiveness of um, using a dugaz and eagle owl for a variety of raptor species, and it included Egyptian vulture, which they'd had no success um, trapping, but I think it was only a small number of territories. I'd have to look out the paper. Uh, Becky is raising hand, please. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if anyone could use decoys in maybe like the walk-in um, traps and anything like that, because I think someone has said previously that they've used kind of flightless birds from captive breeding programs, but would decoys be a, an idea for the future? Um, we have not tried with decoys, but uh, could be an option, especially in our case. Um, what we, we see is that the birds that we release from the captive breeding program that are released, Usually they are the first that start 
entering into the cage and the others are you know naturally uh, naturally following them inside the cage so uh, in Ron's case they use birds in, because the cage is closed so they cannot get out uh, with decoys we have tried with griffon vouchers using decoys and it didn't work like they were scared they were scared of them so they avoided but yeah you can try and since we have only 15 minutes left i would like to speak also on the on the other topic which is the the tagging methods um and to share experience on the different uh, tagging methods and and uh, you know the pros and cons uh, who would like to start maybe the maybe just to like to present few of them and uh, then to see what's the experience so far, not also from our side, but also from, from the other guys here. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe to start with the, with the backpack and then the leg whoop and see uh, who uses what. Yeah, in our, in our case, we, we, years ago, we started with the backpack uh, method. Now we switch to leg loop simply because we believe that it's more safe uh, for the birds. Um, so far, we had two cases of uh, Egyptian vouchers tagged with a, with a backpack harness that one of the strings obviously broke at some point and the transmitter was uh, hanging from the bird and still one of these individuals, it's in Greece, uh, it's in Albania actually, um, in the border area between Albania and Greece. And this individual has a hanging transmitter for already about four years now, and it cannot remove it and we cannot retrap to remove the tag. So, so it's not good for the, for the bird for sure. And the other individual was, uh, had a hanging transmitter for two years. And with the, with the leg loop, we, are, um, we feel very confident using uh, the leg loop because if something goes wrong, just the transmitter fell off, falls off the bird. So there is no harm on the bird uh, at all. Uh, the negative side of the leg loop is of course that the battery is not charging that well because uh, the transmitter is covered by the wings, but it's not such a problem for the Egyptian voucher because it spends uh, all of the year in sunny places like in summer in the north it's sunny enough and the day is long enough to charge the battery and then in the winter it goes to africa uh, so there are no major issues with the battery with these species and also another positive side of the leg loop we think is that uh, when the birds are walking or perching uh, the wings are covering the transmitter so it's completely invisible for to to people uh, and and is not attracting uh, some the attention of the local people, for example, in Africa or in the Middle East, because we had cases before of birds being killed because of the transmitters and considering them as spies. So we don't want the people to see that the birds are carrying a device and the leg loop ensures that. So from our experience using the two methods, we... We are happy with the leg loop more than uh, the backpack and we'll continue using these methods. Just to, uh, I completely agree, but just to give the the other side, because I know some people uh, are against the leg loop. Uh, for example, I have long conversations about it with uh, Todd Katzner, who tags mainly golden eagles, but not only. And what these people say is that it's it's it might be problematic because it doesn't sit on the center of the body. Um, because it, it puts too much weight on the back, which is not as easy for the bird to handle as uh, weights in the middle of the back. I'm not sure if it's true. I, I think it's not true. I, I saw some papers that showing the no effects on survival between the two methods, uh, but just to say the other side. Yeah. Uh, also another consideration that was discussed during a workshop a few years ago in the UK was that the dragging effect of the leg loop harness is uh, is less is smaller than with the backpack which for a long distance migrant uh, might have a might have some impact especially those birds that are crossing the sea 
Uh, probably it's a bit more difficult for them if they wear a backpack than a leg loop because the dragging effect is, is larger. It's just another point. And it's also much faster to, to tag the bird yeah. with the leg loop. Yeah, this Let is like one of the best uh, sides of the leg loops. And, and less room for error. When you do a backpack, it can really change. And when you do a leg loop, it's just in place. It's much easier. Yeah, really easy to set and compare to the to the backpack. Yeah. And... Um, anybody else wants to to share some experience with the with these or other methods of of tagging Egyptian vouchers? I know that um, one of the things we wanted to look at was sort of capacity building in these methods, um, trapping and um, tagging techniques. So I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts on that or opportunities that they could share. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Lale. I just would like to ask about this leg loop method. Is it more expensive than the backpack no uh, you use the maybe it's even less expensive because yeah. you use the same teflon the same teflon ribbon yeah. uh you just put the transmitter through the legs of the birds not through the wings so uh, you you even use less teflon uh with the leg loop than with the backpack but yeah generally they're, they're you don't need anything else, just the transmitter and the Teflon and, and that's it. How about the data you provide from, is it less or the same? Uh, it's the same, it's, it the... yeah, it depends on the battery. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah, um, if the birds spend some time, you know, in, in some bad weather conditions, mostly sitting or, or, you know, roosting and then the battery is not charging that well. So you might, you know, you might have some uh, battery drainage, but uh, generally with the Egyptian voucher, it's not a major issue. And also it's, yeah. uh, uh, it's really nice to, uh, actually it can be practiced also uh, by uh, less uh, experienced people who are, have never been tagging birds before because it's really easy to repeat and to learn it. So it's also like uh, really friendly uh, to use and uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Mohammed Habib wants to to join. Uh, regarding you, you raised two two question. Uh, one uh, been answered by Ron Efrat uh, about the delay of the of the spring migration. Uh, while I was surveying in the eastern south part of Egypt, that the uh, Egyptian vulture he used to stop over longer during the spring migration uh, the reason is could be uh, the harsh and uh, really hot climate in, in in our region this is number one and also searching for fresh water uh, so he can uh, 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 able to to fly back this is uh, 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 my thought about the delaying uh, number two for uh, traveling uh, I'm using, I, I never use for the Egyptian vulture, vulture but I'm, I'm doing for seabirds. Uh, I just put bait and then I have um, a kind of um, a, a semicircle uh, made from metal with a two pivot, but the pivot was uh, beaded in, in two sides. And then I put a uh, um, transparent net, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, not easy for the bird to recognize it. Because I tried the, the yellow one, shiny yellow one, uh, because it was the only one in the in our shops. And later on, I realized that, that the birds is seeing it. But when I put the transparent, it's almost like the fishing line, uh, the same color like a fishing line in it. Uh, I, it's easy for me to trap uh, 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 birds. So, so if uh, it's really easy, if in, in, in our region, which is really difficult to find food, uh, uh, for regarding to the Egyptian vulture, if we put bait like uh, uh, chicken uh, or uh, piece of, of, of sheep, and then uh, for sure that the vulture will come 
let's say within a few hours and then you can and trap this is just an idea about uh, traveling in our region thanks uh, Rigas? Thank you. Uh, yes if you hear me i want to yeah. confirm that uh, the look uh, the, the this method is very easy for uh, people it's very uh, fast um, comparing to back uh, back uh, backpack in griffon vultures as, as we have uh, done this uh, in mesology area and uh, this uh, means that uh, you can uh, uh, make the work more uh, fast and involving more people and uh, handling the birds etc is more easy uh, takes less time and uh, we had never accident uh, with like uh, cut it, uh, Teflon, ribbon, etc., which uh, was a problem in uh, backpack. So I would suggest uh, by sure that the look lab uh, is uh, uh, the best uh, method uh, I've seen as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the in the chat, I pasted uh, one practical guide for methods for attaching uh, transmitters to vouchers and condors that was developed during this workshop of the voucher specialist group uh, a few years ago. So in this practical guide, uh, you can find a lot of uh, different methods and it is discussed what are the positive and negative sides of um, all of them. So, so you can actually read uh, in details about the different tagging methods that were used on vouchers uh, so far if you're not familiar with it please let me know if you cannot download it from this link because it's in research gate and i can send it uh, separately as well <clears throat> are there any plans for trapping and tagging egyptian vouchers in areas that this hasn't been done uh, yet in 2023 maybe it's going to be good to see if somebody plans something like that and um, we can support it if if we are able to support it in a way it might be useful Yes, Lale. I'm planning, but it will depend on the fund I get. So it's not clear yet if it will be ready for 2013, but I have that plan. Okay. And we are talking about this with the ministry as well, with the wildlife department. Okay, great. So in, hopefully, yeah. In which in which area? Uh, well, uh, of Turkey. I mean, we have tagged in northeastern Turkey with Evan and Chan, yeah. 12 there. And there are some in mid Anatolia, but not yeah. the other part of the species range. Uh, we are planning to do in one of that, but still we are discussing about it. Yeah. I'm thinking as part of my PhD, so okay. I'm still working on it. We'll let you know when things are more clear. Yeah, that would be great. We'll be glad to share experience yeah, and you. help if we, yeah, that, if we can that would be great thank you yeah, and good luck with uh, getting the funds <laughs> for your thank work. you that's the hard part <laughs> of this work yeah we actually haven't uh, discussed the uh, like uh, which tax work best uh i mean it's like a kind of a, a different topic but related uh yeah, but maybe it's the most important is that uh, I guess if you if somebody wants to tag uh, to tag Egyptians or other raptors, just uh, like uh, just uh, texting to to others that have already experienced. So in order to to get the best information on different uh, manufacturers and and devices that you can use actually for birds, because it it it, it makes it makes a difference. Uh, Guido asked a question in the in the chat if we can provide detailed information on how to install the leg loop for a video um yes guido we uh, like in the uh in this practical guide that i shared there is a very uh, detailed information about that and also we have a video that's not very professional uh but we can share it uh, with you so you can see how it is done uh in practice uh so i'll be I will send it to you after the end of, uh, of the session. 
Yeah, and regarding manufacturers, we have two minutes left. So if somebody wants to share something. Let's uh, use it. Uh, I we, think, uh, we and the Israelis, we use Ornitella. So <laughs> we are the yeah. big fans of Ornitella transmitters now. But for some countries in Africa, they do not have the best coverage. And now we realized, for example, that in Ethiopia, the contract with the local mobile operator was uh, terminated. So we have birds in Ethiopia and we don't receive any data. So it very much depends on where, where you're tagging birds and where your birds are going in order to, you know, to choose the, the best producer. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> I mean, considering the area of where you tag birds or actually what 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 species and also like uh regard my experience if you if you're like uh if you're tagging raptors in like in uh, on the central asian flyway uh in central asia india pakistan i believe for works best and it's like the yeah you have a good coverage almost everywhere so birds are never uh they never lost signal which is jenny, jenny is raising hand yeah, so cell track uh, making a kind of hybrid tag, which has provides GSM data kind of similar to what we are used to from Ornatello or from microwave, but then it has a kind of a death mode if it likes. If it detects little movement, it goes on to kind of using the Argos network like a traditional GPS tag. So you have the dual functionality where you get lots of GPS fixes for relatively low cost using the GSM network, but then they um will work out of range um, if something should happen to the bird, but they're still a bit big for Egyptian vultures, but they're being mm. trialed on golden eagles at the moment. Okay, cool. So unfortunately we don't have more time. I hope the discussion was fruitful and useful to, to most of you. And now it's time to go back to the main, um, the main platform and enjoy some session, the next session in the afternoon. It was nice, nice seeing you and exchanging thoughts. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye bye. Thank you.